What's up, Warriors, and welcome to another episode of the Mental Health Movement Podcast, Voice for the Voiceless. I am your host, Chris, and it is October 1st, 2024, and I cannot believe we are almost done with this year. I feel like the last couple months have gone by so incredibly fast. I feel like I just got out of vacation, and that was almost two months ago. Um, so today's guest uh, we have is um, she is the creator of a, a company called Rose Hope Inc., Um, She's going to talk to us about quantum leaping, which is a form of holistic health. Um, And I'm really excited to talk to her because I was digging a little bit and doing a little research on what she brings to the mental health community. So I'm very excited for this conversation. So please help me welcome Deanne. Deanne, how are you doing? Hello, hello. I'm doing great and so happy to be here with you, Chris. And I love what you're doing. This is so needed. We need this. Originally, whenever Larissa reached out to me and I was kind of reading a little bit more into your story, I'm like, oh, wow, I'm very, very open to the holistic healing side of things because I feel like we're so focused on therapy. We're so focused on medication that just like the holistic healing is always there, but it's not talked about nearly enough. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I so agree with you. And, you know, I struggled my whole life uh, with depression. Uh, because I felt like I was in this world, but not really of it. You know, I felt really out of place. And, uh, and so I went through my own mental health journey. And and what I found was my connection with my my own spirit, my own soul. And that has been such a gift for me in understanding why I'm here, and helping me to move through the trials and tribulations of life, so to speak, right? Right. So, so tell us a little bit about that. Tell us uh, where your journey started and how you got from there to the Rose Hope Inc. How did that all become a thing for you? Oh, so I actually experienced a near death when I was just five years old. I was eating one of those round jawbreaker candies. You remember those round hard candies? And my dad said, Deanne, go sit down before you choke. And I turned to go sit down and sure enough, took a breath in and I choked. So he came and wrapped his arms around me, started doing the Heimlich. And I remember in my five-year-old mind thinking my head was going to pop off. Like that was the fear in that moment. And he couldn't get that out. And so I went limp in his arms. And in that moment, I actually had an out-of-body experience. I floated above my dad as he panicked below. I watched my mom run to the phone to call for help. I watched my older sister peek around the corner to see what the commotion was about. And I felt total peace. I felt like I was being held in the arms of God or creator, source, whatever you want to call that. And it was incredibly powerful. However, I was only five. (laughs) So, you know, that experience started to shape me. And of course, my dad ultimately did get that jawbreaker out and he got me breathing again. So, you know, after that experience, my mom started to notice some changes in me. Um, And one of which was that I started to have really lucid dreams. I started to have night terrors, actually. And um, they were really scary. And I didn't really know what was happening to me, but I became very sensitive as well. Um, So I would be able to pick on pick up on people's energy. Um, And so that experience really started to show up, especially when I started to tell my mom that I would see things or know things that I shouldn't know. Like she would be so surprised. I'd get up in the morning and say, mom, so-and-so died in my dream last night. And her jaw would hit the floor because she had just got off the phone with somebody learning that that person had died. And so because I was raised in a Catholic home and it was very loving, I had a really beautiful upbringing, but mom didn't really know what to do with me. So, and I didn't really know what to do with myself. So I hid a lot of the things that I saw and felt because I thought that there was something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. And so that carried into, you know, my adulthood. I was an overachiever people pleaser because when you have a near death, you almost feel like you have to prove yourself to the world, right? Like I was like, okay, God gave me a second chance. I better prove that it was a good it was a good second chance, you know? And so I got caught up in this overachieving people pleasing that led me to a career in um, EMS. Uh, so became an EMT and firefighter. You know, I wanted to save lives like my dad had saved mine. Right. right? Um, but that experience was actually added a lot of trauma for me because now I had these like energies that I could feel, you know, these spirits. And I thought I was losing my mind. So I left that profession 
I ended up going into the dental profession and then I ended up teaching, which I loved teaching. It was such a passion for me. But then something else really profound happened. I had a second near death. Now, I want to just say this. You don't have to have a near-death experience just to choose the path of going into your soul or building right. a relationship with your soul. I just want to give that caveat. Um, but in my second near-death, now being an adult, it was very different from my experience when I was five. Right. So I was actually at home recovering from knee surgery. And um, I had some sort of weird response to the medication I was on. And I was actually hobbling on my crutches to get from the kitchen to the my bed that I'd set up in the living room. And I, all of a sudden, I started to see black. And before I knew it, I was gone. And so where I went, I can only describe Chris as heavenly. I felt complete peace. I felt pure love. I felt this euphoric feeling. It was like a high like no other. And around me were these beautiful, bright, orbs of light and they were lights of all colors like turquoises and and purples and pinks like it was so vibrant and I knew in in my mind I knew that they were angels I just had a knowing and for a brief moment I thought about oh my god I don't want to leave everyone behind and then before I knew it that thought was gone and the new thought was oh my gosh I'm gonna stay here this is amazing like this is heaven and as I had that thought, even though they didn't use words, I heard them in my mind say, you're not done yet. You have work to do, as happens in many near deaths. So I woke up, I came to, and I didn't know how to articulate what had just happened to me. And I was afraid to tell people because I thought, oh, my gosh, I really am going crazy now. You know, right. really start to question. And so I'm like, I'm losing my mind here. So in the days to follow, though, it was such a profound experience for me. I just had to tell people. I just knew I had to share it with the people I felt safe with. So a few days later, I'm in, in my house. I'm telling a girlfriend of mine that I felt safe with. I'm telling her about this angelic experience. I'm like, you're not going to believe this, but this is what happened to me. And my brother-in-law actually was with me at the time when I fainted. He was the one that caught me. Right. And... Um, and he overheard me telling her about these angels and he runs into the kitchen and he slammed his hand on the counter. He said, I knew it. I felt the angels too. Can you believe what? it? Yes. So when I went completely unresponsive, he was checking for a pulse. He didn't think I was breathing. He was about to call 911 and he was panicking because like I was like lifeless. Right. <laughs> Excuse me. And so he started to panic. And then he said he felt energies come in and he said, they said, it's okay. She's okay. She's going to be just fine. And he said, within a few seconds after that happened, I woke up with a smile on my face. Oh, so wow. like I get goosebumps talking about it every time because nice. that was such a pivotal moment for me where I was like, oh my gosh, I am saying I'm not losing my mind. This really was an experience that I had, and he was evidence of that for me. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that gave me the courage to start sharing the story. And a lot of people are like, oh, so after that near death, then you figured it out. No, I didn't. It took me a little while still, Chris. Right. I still have to go through a few things in my own journey because I was so hooked into this game of I'll be happy when. Yeah. You ever play that game? Always. Like, I'll be happy when the bill is paid. I'll Every be happy day. when the money is done. Yeah. Yeah. It's a losing game though. Really that's, the, that's the thing. Yeah. And so I was like, I'll be happy when I get married and I have children. And I have success in my business. I got all of that and I was miserable. Right. I was so depressed. And then I felt guilty and shameful because how dare I not feel happy when I have everything anyone could ever want. Right. Yeah. yeah. So then I was being swallowed in that guilt and the shame. I hit a really um, dark night of the soul. Um, and I came into a deep depression. Now I was also postpartum for my second child and didn't know it. Right. Um, my, my son was about six months old and I was not happy. And I just thought to myself, it would be better if I just wasn't here. Right. You know, and mm -hmm. that gives me chills talking about that too, because, you know, I think back and I think, how could I have possibly wanted to leave my children? But in that moment, I just felt like I 
I was in such despair and such mm -hmm. pain emotionally, right. I really couldn't see a way out. Right. So I ended up one night praying and I said, okay, God, this is the path that I'm choosing right now. Can you show me another path? And you, I got to tell you, it was the most beautiful experience. I was given a vision. And so a vision was brought to me and I saw the vision so clearly. I knew that I was going to now take this other path. And so I made a choice. And that next morning I got up and my whole world changed. So that's what it took for me to really choose to be willing to build a relationship with my spirit, with my soul. Right. And some might call it the higher self. You know, we have a God self, a true self, a higher self. You know, I sometimes reference it as, as the soul self. Um, and really that. that relationship saved me. Yeah. And so I love to speak about the power of building that relationship because ultimately there is nothing else. Once we've established that beautiful relationship within ourselves, yeah. then we get to see the reflection of that in the outer world. Isn't That's that amazing? It. Yeah. We start um, to tune into our inner technology. Right. And that's where the magic is. So that's what led me into doing this work and realizing I was an intuitive, realizing I had psychic abilities. All of those other things started to build and develop as I journeyed with my soul. That's beautiful. Um, thank you for sharing that. That's a that's a hell of a journey to get to where you are right now. And, you know, um, so I, I, I've attempted to, you know, terminate my life twice, uh, once at yeah. 14, once at 27. Wow. 14, uh, you know, teenage years for a lot of people, it's just really hard to understand why yeah. you do something, right? Um, now, when you're in your adult life and you're trying to figure things out, you know, late 20s and just was numbing myself for years, just bitter and angry at the world because I didn't understand it. And I had, um, I got a phone call from uh, from my now late brother. Mm. Um, I posted a suicide note on Facebook and deleted it within like five minutes, not even because I didn't want that attention. Um, yeah. He saw it before I deleted it and wow. he called me. He said, Hey man, I just want you to know, uh, I saw what you posted and I want you to know that I'm here for you and I care about you. I don't want you to do anything to hurt yourself. Mm. So I sat there in my car, you know, just ready to go and doing what I was going to do. And I didn't do it because we had that conversation. Cause I just, you know, I just wanted to be heard, right? Uh, yes. And yeah. a couple of years after that, I had a really good friend of mine pass away during the pandemic. Uh, she passed away of liver failure. Mm. And again, he was there for me, helping me grieve, you know, helping me, you know, trying to understand why she was gone. And he was very religious too. And you're like, you know, this is God's will. She's not suffering anymore. I'm like, okay, I, I can, I can understand that to an extent. It still hurts, but I can understand where you're coming from. Wow. Year later, he passes away. A uh, drunk driver took his life. Um, oh. After he passed away, mm -hmm. my thing has always been going to sunsets, you know, just to mm -hmm. embrace all the things that we have down here in Florida when we when it is beautiful down here, when we have yeah. those sunsets and breezes. Mm -hmm. The first week, I'm getting goosebumps talking about it. Um, the Me first too. week after he passed away, I remember a pretty warm to cool breeze while I'm watching the sun go down, just like embrace me. Yes. And that's when I, I thought to myself, I'm like, I need to tell my story. I need to mm -hmm. continue doing what he was cheering me on to do. Mm -hmm. And that was start this podcast. And that was to meet people like yourself, yeah. to help others share their platform and share their story. And out of all the stories I've heard, all the different platforms that I've, you know, come across with people that I've had on this podcast, yours hits me the hardest because of just like that afterlife experience is yeah. such a real feeling that you can't possibly describe it to somebody who doesn't understand. It's true. And it's true. when you see all those things that you went through manifest into strength instead of that pain that you experienced for so long. Like you said, at the beginning of telling your story, you don't have to go through loss or an attempt or almost 
near-death experience to feel this. But when you do go through that one thing in your life that just makes or breaks you, mm-hmm. and you can create something as powerful as you've created, as I've created, as so many others, it is such an indescribable and beautiful feeling. Mm, there's such power in that, Chris. Yeah, amen to that. And what a legacy that you're carrying on for your brother. I think it's such a beautiful gift how you speak about him. And I can feel the connection that you have. You know, um, it's really quite potent. And it's beautiful that we can take something that was maybe so traumatic and so difficult and we can bring it to life and bring beauty to it. That's the magic of this world. Isn't it? it? You can't help but put a smile on your face when you think about that we could take something that we perceive as so awful or so difficult and we can birth new life from it. Right. That's the beauty. So, you know, going back into your story a little bit and um, you mentioned that you faced that shame and that guilt for having all the things that that you had. And I guess hearing those voices say you're not grateful for what you had. So. How did you get through that? Like, how did you fight those thoughts? Like that stigma of you should be grateful and not feel all these things. Right. Yeah. And, you know, being conditioned and raised where it's like you had to feel guilty and shameful if you did something wrong, like that was your penance, you know, and that's how you're forgiven is to feel really bad about it. Right. Right. And, and, you know, I've realized now that that is, you know, not right um, for me at least. But the biggest thing that I've learned, come to understand about this, is that we have different aspects of our mind, our beingness, right? We're multidimensional beings. So I mentioned, I talked about the higher mind, the higher self, the soul self. And then we've got our ego mind, which in metaphysics, we call the false self. Because that ego mind, think thousands and thousands of years ago, the ego mind was meant to keep us safe from the predators, right? To know when to run. And so the ego mind does have a place, but over thousands of years, that ego aspect of our mind is hijacking us. So it's coming in and it's saying, oh, you, no one's going to listen to your story. Or it's telling you whatever story that is trying to keep you safe, but is actually holding you hostage. And so what I've learned to do is I've learned to build relationship with that aspect of myself. So just like I built this relationship with my soul, I built this relationship with my ego mind. And so when the ego comes in, it's usually negative. You know, it's usually the negative part that comes in and it's telling me all sorts of lies. And so I call it out. I call it out now. I say, oh, that's interesting that that's coming up. I wonder what we can do differently. And I want to share a quick story about how powerful the ego mind is, because this was so profound for me. I was um, I was working on a degree in my 20s. I also have a health management degree and I was doing it distance, raising a family, doing all the things. And I was on the last test of my very last class. I was on the home stretch like I was finishing this degree. And in the previous course that I had taken my second last class for the first time ever, I had failed an exam. And that was quite devastating. But I rewrote it and I passed and all was well. But that stayed with me. So as I'm writing this final test, as I'm writing the test, my ego's coming in and it's saying, you don't know any answers to the questions. You're going to fail this. Da, 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 da. Well, by the time I was done the exam, I was so distraught. I ran to my car. I bawled my eyes out. I called my partner. I said, I just failed. Like, this is the five. It's all oh, so close to being done, but I failed. And, da, da, da. and they said, take some breaths. Let's get home. We'll talk about it. So I get home and I'm so distraught about it. I email my professor and I email them and I say, I know it's Easter weekend because it was an Easter weekend. But I said, I know that I failed this test and I want to prepare for the rewrite and know where I messed up. Is there any way that you can have a look at my test? And then I get an email back from my professor and it says, I don't know whose test you think you wrote, but you got 87%. (laughs) You guys, come on. Like, this is the power of the ego mind. I, I hooked into that story and so much so I believed it. And we do this all the time. We do this all the time where we get hooked into a story that the ego's telling us and it's not even true. 
And yet we let ourselves make decisions based on the story that isn't even true. And so I've learned to lovingly get my ego to step aside, even just saying the words, thanks, ego, but I've got this is helpful. But I take it a step further. You give your ego mind a name. Okay, you name that ego mind. And I had a client the other day, she said, I'm going to name mine Ivana Gripe a lot. Isn't that (laughs) hilarious? (laughs) <laughs> I want to gripe a lot. You know, you can call your ego whatever you want, but the idea is not that we're rejecting it completely. We're just setting boundaries. Right. We're saying, wait a second, is that even true? Am I buying into that story that you're telling me? Because the ego is it, that's what its job is to keep us safe, right? So it thinks it's keeping us safe, but really what it's doing is taking away our true power of free will and our ability to make heart-led powerful decisions that are in deep alignment for us right so again how i combated that those thoughts in my head was actually playing within myself and building these awesome relationships within myself and that means becoming the witness that means becoming the witness and not getting caught up on the hamster wheel that so many of us get caught up on breaking those those cycles that were uh, conditioned to you growing up through negative, uh, uh, negative voices, negative people that life. That's Uh, right. Essentially, it's almost like imposter syndrome. You know, you feel like you're not doing enough. You feel like even though, you know, deep down that you've done so much, I I actually, um, talked to my therapist about that, maybe about six months to a year ago. And I said, I don't feel like I'm doing anything. Like, I don't feel like the the mental health group on Facebook is doing anything. I don't feel like the podcast is helping anybody. And I just drilled in my head. I'm like, you're not supposed to be doing this. You're not helping anybody. Mm -hmm. And she just said, I want you to stop right there. I want you to look at all the places that you reached on your own. You didn't put money into it. You didn't hire somebody to make sure you get specific places. You networked, you did all that. You told your story. You let others tell their story. Mm -hmm. And when you reaffirm all the good things that you're doing in your life, and I, I say this to so many people, affirmations are so underrated and not utilized nearly enough. I agree. All, all it takes is the second you get out of the shower to look in the mirror, like, hey, you are enough. I love you. Yes. Drilling that into your mind every single day, you're going to believe it and you're going to be untouchable. You're going to be unstoppable yeah. from that ego. And like you said, my favorite word, boundaries. Boundaries Mm -hmm. go beyond the negative people in our life. You have to have boundaries within yourself too. Yeah. You absolutely do. It it go it's within and without. You know, we have to set the boundaries within ourselves. And then it makes it easier for us to set boundaries outside of ourselves too. You know, what it comes back to is recognizing that our outer world is a reflection of our inner world. Right. And so if we're feeling uh, trauma and anger and all of those things inside of us, guess what we're going to witness outside of us. So we have this beautiful, powerful opportunity again to tune into our own inner technology. It's been innately given to us and it's been again clouded by all the conditioning and all the negativity and the fear and whatever else is happening. But we do have a choice in that and we can start cleaning out the mock and we can start really seeing the truth of it and coming to a place where we can really start to witness heaven on earth happening right before our eyes, where we can start to feel the joy, even when, even when something looks like, you know, it's falling apart, you know, how many times have, has something happened to you where like you lost a job or you broke up with somebody only to realize weeks, maybe months later, maybe even years later, that that was the best thing that ever happened to you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so it's about shifting the lens in which we desire to look at the world. And there's this beautiful opportunity to look at ourselves first, of course, tune into the frequencies that we want within ourselves first. Mm -hmm. And then you cannot help but get that that reality outside of you. I absolutely agree. And, you know, it kind of goes in the same conversation as grief. You know, it's a it's not always about death. And I think that's the biggest misconception about grief is You can grieve a former part of yourself. You can grieve a friendship that you thought was the greatest thing ever. But I'll give you a good example. I was really good friends with a girl for about 11 years. 
I did everything for her. And, and again, I'm a really big people pleaser as well. And mm. this is pre therapy me. So right. I wouldn't do that. The things I did for her now because mm. I had boundaries for myself, but when her and I stopped talking, I was devastated. I was just like, well, I'm never going to find a friend like that ever again. I'm not good enough for friendships. I suck. You know, I'm a piece of shit. I'm this and that. Mm. Uh, when I started therapy and, you know, she was one of the very first conversations that I had. I'm like, I, I don't know how to move on past a a friendship that I valued so much. And then we kind of t- started talking about it a little bit about the things I would do to her, do for her. Uh, I hid her from the cops when she did something wrong. You know, I, I did a lot of things for her that most people probably wouldn't do for regular friends in their life. She was a leech and I didn't realize it. She, uh-huh. she took so much energy out of me as a person that I've had guns held at my face because of her. You know, uh-huh. I, the, the breaking, the, the straw that broke the camel's back was we all went to a bar together and she let me drive home drunk or drive her home drunk and didn't stop me. Um, uh-huh. I don't ever do that. I never drink and drive. And that, you know, that's something that I watched my dad do my whole life and I don't ever want to be that guy. Mm-hmm. And for that one night, I was that guy. Yeah. And I, I genuinely got upset with her. I'm like, listen, you saw how much I drank and you allowed me to drive you home without without you being concerned about my well-being. And we had a big disagreement after that. And, you know, we were no longer friends. And, you know, like I said, grieving is something that so many people just think it has to do with death. And it's, it could be something further from the truth. It's, it could be friendships. It could be a former self. It could be a job that you absolutely love that you got fired from. Grieving is something that that is another mind mind trick that we it tell really ourselves. Is. Yeah, it really is. Can I share something about grief? Because I've, I've had a tremendous amount of loss in my life. Um, when I went through high school, I think I was at a funeral every other month. Wow. Um, aunts, uncles, friends, you name it. Um, some of the greatest loves of my life um, have died, unfortunately. But here's the thing about grief. Number one, it reminds us of the love and the connection we once had. And that's a beautiful thing in itself. But number two, Oftentimes, whenever we have an energy like grief show up, it could be anger, sadness, whatever we perceive as low vibration, right? So these energies come up in our lives and our typical response is like, I don't want to feel that. And so we push it away, right? We distract ourselves, we numb ourselves, we escape in whatever we have to so we don't have to feel that. But energy is the same as like a little kid. I want you to think about grief as like a little child that just wants to be seen and heard. And you talked about the power of being seen and heard. And when we hold that grief, and I like to actually hold it in my hands, like I'm holding a little bunny or a little bird or something. And I say, hi, grief. And usually I'm bawling my eyes out, right? I say, hi, grief. I see you. And I know you're teaching me something. I know you're showing me something. Tell me what it is I need to learn, what I need to grow, what I need to understand from you. So what happens as soon as we lean in in that way, in that loving, tender way, the grief says, oh, thank goodness, they see me and hear me. I don't need to be this pesky thorn in their side anymore. Already we begin to alchemize or shift that energy of that grief. And so that's one of the most powerful tools that I've used is I actually let myself lean in a little bit and I say, okay, I'm witnessing you. I see you and I hear you. And so we give the grief a voice in a way rather than putting it away, putting it away. And I spent my whole life, you know, putting away those feelings, you know, again, overachiever. I'll just keep myself busy doing work and I'll keep myself busy achieving so that I don't have to deal with the pain of the grief or the anger, whatever it is. And so being able to have that power and to alchemize that energy is such a beautiful thing. And it can help us to, again, learn even more because everything has value here. Even the, 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 you know, driving drunk that had value for you because you recognize that that was a line you never wanted to cross. And someone that you thought loved you allowed you to cross that line. And of course, you obviously will take responsibility for your choice in that. But at the same time, 
it also happened so that you could see that that person was no longer vibrationally, energetically in alignment for you because that wasn't the person that you want to show up as. Yeah. And so in a way, that experience was a wonderful gift for you because it was like, hey, Chris, you're doing your dad. You don't want it. You said you'd never do this. Yeah. And it probably hit you really hard. Yep. And so even that experience, rather than looking at it as being like, oh, man, that was so awful. And I lost a friend in that. It can be, wow, look at what I learned. Look at what I gained from yeah. that. Mm -hmm. So that we're receiving the value and everything has something in it for us. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, um, before we move on from the grief conversation, I just want to make a quick comment about it as well. Um, grief can be used as a weapon too. And I feel mm -hmm. so many people will yeah. ask you a favor, ask you to go somewhere with them. Oh, well, so-and-so would love you to do this, even if it makes you uncomfortable. And that's where boundaries coming yeah. every single time when you grieve you have to have those boundaries for yourself because so many people that don't even realize they're doing it will have those narcissistic tendencies and try to control you with that grief yeah and, you know um i just went on a week-long cruise with my with my family and i didn't initially want to go because of money you know it's just me supporting myself and I don't have anybody to fall back on. And my dad was like, oh, well, you don't know if this is going to be your grandma's last vacation because, you know, she's older and, you know, we're all going to pass away. So, oh. yeah, <laughs> that is a weapon. Little um, guilt trip. Yeah. And, you know, it's one of those things, guys. Boundaries is the most important part of probably every conversation you have with people is just making sure that you're putting yourself first, even if you're a people pleaser, you got to try and put yourself first in everything you do. I'm so glad that you are bringing up boundaries because it's been something I've been really working on. Um, I recently had an experience with a client who I loved and I was seeing so much transformation in her and she start, she stopped paying. And so I was reaching out to her to be like, Hey, what's going on? And then she ghosted me. Hmm. So this client who owed me a considerable amount of money uh, no longer was paying and now she was ghosting me and I was feeling very hurt by that so I was like okay Deanne you're going to start setting boundaries so I sent an email terminating her contract basically letting her walk away yeah. um, but still holding her accountable for the work that we have done and the hours that I put in um, and I got a little bit I called her on some stuff I'll admit that I did you know I commented on the lack of integrity and that's concerning for me and I hope that she can reflect on that yeah. Um, and I actually felt really good about it. And once I terminated that contract, something really powerful happened. A client showed up for me three days later and said, sign me up for your big program. Wow. So letting that go made room for something better. And it reminds me, there was this little meme that was floating around for a while. And it was an image of a little girl holding a teddy bear. And in front of her was Jesus hiding a giant teddy bear behind him. And he's gesturing hand over the little teddy bear, because if you hand over the little teddy bear, you make room for the big teddy bear. And so that's the thought that came to my mind with that. Now, that being said, since that happened, this a client that I terminated the contract with, and I hate using that word, it sounds harsh, but I ended the contract with, um, I had made a post on social media and dug at me a little bit. And I immediately felt like shrinking up, like I felt so hurt by it. I went back through my email. I went and apologized to her for my email and everything like this is back to people pleaser 101, right? And I realized, number one, no wonder I struggle to set boundaries because people don't like it when you set boundaries, yeah. right? And yeah. it reminded me of the quote by Brene Brown. She says, the people that are disappointed when you start setting boundaries are the ones who benefited from you not having any in the first place, mm, yeah. right? It's and so, point. yeah, this person's going to be upset. They're going to get defensive. They're going to blame me, right? It's just part of the process. But what I also realized is that I needed to be that hard with that person. I needed to draw the line with that person because they're no longer in vibrational frequency with me and the work I'm doing. And if they're going to go around and slander me or whatever, say whatever they're going to say, it's okay. Because people who know my heart and the people who get to know me, they know me without judgment. Right, right. Right. 
And so, you know, so a lot of learning around the boundaries. I have a little protocol for boundaries. I don't know if you want to hear it, yes, please. Um, but it's super fun. It's the peace protocol. Okay. So I love acronyms. I love formulas. So P in peace stands for pause. And so when someone says, hey, you should really come on this cruise, the first response is always now pause. Even if I know it's going to be a yes for me, I always pause. I say, thank you. Let me get back to you. And so this can go for anyone who's asking for favors or whatever. So now I just pause. I don't give them a yes or no right away. I pause. I buy myself time. So that's the first P. The E in peace is evaluate. Do I even want to? Mm. Because that's the next one. And sometimes as people pleasers, we're doing stuff we don't really want to do, right? And so I evaluate, do I even want to do this? So that's the E in peace. And if it's a yes that I want to do it, then I go to the A in peace. The A in peace is ask, do I have the time, energy, and capacity to do the thing? Yeah. Right? Like, do I even do I even have the time? Like, okay, yeah, I want to do the thing. But do I even have the time, energy, capacity to do the thing, right? right. Mm -hmm. Then we go to C, and C is the conditions, mm -hmm. conditions that need to be met in order for me to say yes. So again, back to your cruise example, maybe you want to go, maybe you do have the time, energy, capacity, but what are the conditions? Maybe the conditions are that, you know, maybe someone has to pay for half of the trip if they really want you to go. Or maybe the condition is that you can go on the trip, but it has to be in a certain time window, whatever the conditions are, Right. And sometimes I like to even add and consequences to not having the conditions met. So that's the C in peace. And then the last D is to embrace and celebrate that you have set a boundary. Because if we're not celebrating the work that we're doing, we're missing out. I love so that. there's the peace protocol. For you. <laughs> I like that. I'm gonna I'm gonna use that because that's a it's a good one. I feel like uh, whenever we set boundaries, we we struggle just to even start that conversation with ourselves of setting that right. boundary um yeah yeah so the next, exactly. uh, you know, we, we kind of alluded to it uh earlier um quantum leaping tell me yeah. about oh yes okay so one of my areas of specialty is known as the akashic records mm -hmm. the akashic records is your soul's library i like to call it god's library as well but it is a space of everything that is was and ever shall be so it's a quantum field. It is a place of consciousness that we enter into. I use a little prayer to go in. Some people use meditation. And by the way, everyone has access to this, okay? Everyone can access the Akashic field. Some people are already doing it and they don't even know it, okay? This is where we get rid of that ego, where that ego really steps aside for us. And then we can just pull from divine. We can just pull from source, from God, again, whatever it is that you call that. And so... Um, part of this idea of quantum leaping is our, the, here's the thing. There is many versions of me happening right here, right now, simultaneously. Okay. And we're not going to get too dark, far <laughs> down the rabbit hole today, but there is so much available to us right. and everything is energy. So when we talk about quantum leaping, the idea is that we're tuning into a timeline or a vibrational frequency in which what we desire already exists or in which we have another skill set. Now, I heard a story recently about a man who did some quantum leaping and um, he went to a timeline where he could play the piano. He was a pianist. And so he went into that timeline. I don't know how he did it, downloaded the, uh, the, the concepts to play piano and then came back here and then could play the piano. OK, so there's stories like that out there that exist around this idea that we have ultimate access to all of this knowledge and information if we're willing to step into it. Right. So when I talk about quantum leaping, the idea is that we have many, many pathways and higher vibrational pathways than the one that we might be on now. And so we have this choice here. This is the power of free will to choose our own adventure and so we can choose which reality that we want to step into in every given second. Every new second is a new second, right? And so I can decide to say something else right now, and I could decide to say this thing right now, which would take us on a different pathway, right? So we have so much power to choose, and many of us have let go of this power, or we believe that we don't have the power. Right. So that's the first thing you need to understand about this idea of quantum leaping. The second thing is you've got to trust that there is so much more and that that 
divine God source really is an infinite supply for us. We've got to start believing that divine is my supply, you know? So rather than believing that everything we need comes from one another, this is idea that it comes from source. It comes from God. And so once we tune into that energetically, now we're really increasing our vibration so that we can come into receiving mode. The ability to receive is really important. And many people are blocked on the receiving aspect because we think, especially if we're people pleasers and, you know, helpers, service right. people, right? We want to help. We want to pour into other people. That's our mission. But the reality is that we cannot be in full service unless we were, are willing to receive fully as well. Right. And receiving doesn't necessarily mean money and tangible things. Receiving means it makes me feel good when I'm in service. It makes me feel good to help. It's a, you know, it's, it's a wonderful feeling. So I'm going to let myself feel good about it. I'm going to let myself receive there. So when we go into the Akashic field, um, I bring my clients there with me. And what we do is we tune into a pathway that is vibrationally of the highest, most divine existence. And so that might be a pathway where, Chris, you become an award-winning podcaster and you start writing your books and you start speaking on stages. So that might be that pathway for you. So we tune into the frequency of that pathway. Not only do we tune into that frequency, but we take ourselves and we go in and we embody that frequency. So that means that we go into an experience where it's like, okay, I'm here right now. We're visualizing it. We're feeling it. We're sensing it with our whole entire being and allowing ourselves to come into that vibrational field. And so what that does is even when we come out of that experience, it already is increasing our vibration to create the opportunities that we need in order to get to that timeline, in order for us to get to that, that beautiful creation. Right. So, again, reminding you that we have to create that within ourselves in order for it to show up outside of ourselves. Right. That's the secret, right, that many of us maybe forget about. We think, oh, I can wish it into existence. You know, I can I can wish that I can vision it. OK, but if we're not embodying it. And if we're not trusting that it's there and available to us, right. then we're stopping ourselves from being able to get there. If we're not able to receive in life, we're again, blocking ourselves from getting there. So without going again too far down the rabbit hole, that is the basic concept of quantum leaping, quantum jumping, um, and this idea that we can tune into these, uh, these higher vibrational frequencies and we can allow ourselves to meet those frequencies where they're at. Everything so, already exists. So in the conversation of like receiving, would you put that in the same conversation as, uh, say, like manifesting? Like, would that be essentially the same concept? Yeah. I mean, we are, in essence, talking about manifestation, right? And if you've ever read the book, The Secret, or watched the documentary, you know, it's like you can will certain things to happen, you know, if you think about it and if you tune into it. But there's other components that right. a lot of people miss. And they're like, oh, man, like, I've been thinking about this vision my whole life, and it's still not happening. And why is it not happening? And I'm so frustrated, like this manifestation is BS, you yeah. know, um, but it's because typically, we're missing a few fundamentals. Mm -hmm. Typically, we have some um, programmed unconscious beliefs that are playing in the background that are saying, I'm not really worthy to receive or, you know, I'm not good enough to really receive this. So we have this like background that's playing that many of us don't even know is there. So that's one thing that people, um, you know, I encourage people to look at and dig a little deeper within themselves to say, what kind of programming is actually playing in my subconscious? Like what kind of old contracts do I have that are holding me back on that? Right. But again, more than that, it's our ability and our blocks around receiving, and if you want to start practicing the art of receiving, one of the best ways to do that is to actually start saying, I receive, you know, I receive your time today. Thank you so much, Chris. I receive those savings I saved at the grocery store. I received that hug that I got from my child today. So really practicing speaking that language and embodying that frequency of receiving you know? So, I mean, I was blocked on receiving most of my life and I was like working so hard and trying so hard and, you know, struggling and feeling so resentful, 
you know, that I wasn't able to have the things I wanted. But right. once I opened my heart to receiving and understanding that to be in true service, to be a true giver in the world, you have to be willing to receive at the same time. They work hand in hand. I can't be a giver without being a receiver because what happens is we leak energy. We feel exhausted. We feel angry and frustrated because we're giving, giving, giving and not getting anything back. Well, the reality is that most of us are blocking ourselves in some way on the receiving. And again, that digs deeper into the subconscious imprinting of I'm not worthy or what have you. I, I like uh, I like the concept of, of quantum leaping. I think it's, a, it's an interesting point of you know, it's it's a, among the same lines as I guess you can also say affirmations as well. You know, affirmations manifesting, and you know, uh, I could probably relate to the the giving and not not receiving uh, thing all day because it's just uh, I, I I give when I give and uh, just it's really hard for me to uh, receive energy. I guess and maybe it's just because I think that people are me, that I want me from other people. And, you know, sometimes it's unrealistic, you know, sometimes it's not, you meet those very special people that will give, but mm -hmm. it's, it's really hard to find those people. So doing that work for yourself to open your heart to receiving is definitely takes a lot of inner work. It does because we have to start with the receiving within ourselves first, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So you've got to be willing to receive everything that you want to receive from others. You've got to be willing to give it and receive it within yourself first. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's where it gets a little, little tricky because we get kind of caught up again, thinking that we're this one, this dimensional figure when we're multidimensional figure. Right. And so once we can kind of move ourselves a little bit away from ourselves, become the observer a little bit more, we're like, oh, yeah. I can pour love into myself. I can give myself a pat on the back. I can do all of the things that I am asking from other people. I can do it for myself. And once you unlock that, Chris, wow, yeah. then just wait. People just show up and they're going to just be handing you stuff and you're going to be like, oh, wow, look at that. <laughs> right. Magic. So I know uh, I don't want to hold you down too much because I think you said uh, 650, right? Um, yeah. So the last question I'll ask you for today's podcast is if you could change one thing in the mental health community as a whole, what would it be? Oh, it would be to remind people that they are innately loved. Love is given already. You are loved simply because you are simply because you are, you don't have to be anything. You don't have to do anything. You simply exist. And so therefore you have meaning and therefore you are loved. Remember, we came from love. That's how we were created. That's how we came from source or God was through love. So you are love and you are loved. And so I think that sometimes we forget that even when we mess up, even when we're in the pits of despair, even when we're angry, even when we're mean, we are still loved. And so I hope that 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 can land for some of you. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Um, so at the end of every podcast, like I was telling you before we record, I'd like to read a quote, um, you know, mental health related or just uh, based on the topic that we're talking about. Um, before we close out today's podcast, do you have any final words um, for our listeners and where can they find you on socials? Well, my favorite quote that I channeled um, is this. In every given moment, you have everything you need and then some. I love that. So that is a reminder. But yes, oh, please check me out, rosehope.ca. I am up in Canada, um, rosehope.ca. And I just released my, my solo book called The Ark. Ooh. And so this book is on Amazon as well. And it's a story about a girl, not unlike myself, who went through some near deaths. So it is based on my life story, um, but through the eyes of a character who actually goes into the angel kingdom and spends time with the angels and learns powerful things about herself and what she's meant to do in the world. So it's a really, really cool book, a cool read. And I'm so proud of it. I've, it it's been a 20 year project. So um, it's been a long time birthing this baby, so to speak. And um, and so I just encourage people to check it out if they feel compelled to do so. 
I definitely, uh, I think I'm going to take a look at that. That sounds interesting. Um, awesome. Do you have uh, any, any socials besides the website, like Instagram or anything like that? Yeah. Instagram, Rose Hope Soul. You can check me out on Instagram. I also have a YouTube channel, um, which is Rose Hope Ignites. So you can find me on YouTube as well. And I put little videos on there and do little wisdom walks on there and just share whatever's on my mind, whatever's on my heart for that particular season. So um, yes, indeed follow. I'm, I'm excited to expand this reach of mine. I've kind of been in my little bubble, Chris, you know, a small town Canadian gal. And so it's time now it's time for me to be seen and heard. Yeah. yeah. Um, so today's quote comes from Arnold Schwarzenegger, who I think is one of the most brilliant human beings to ever exist and it reads strength does not come from winning your struggles develop your strengths when you go through hardships and decide not to not to surrender that is strength mm. so simple and so powerful right yeah it's amazing keep going in other but, words yeah, yeah keep going um thank you again so much for taking some time out of your week to hop on this podcast uh thought this was a very good conversation Awesome, Chris. I really enjoyed it too. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. And for all my listeners, thank you guys so much for your support as always. Until next time, take care. And as always, be gentle with yourselves. Much love, guys.